Welcome, this is Physical Memory Forensics for Files and Cache. Uh, I'm Justin Murdoch, and to my right is Jamie Butler. Just a bit of a background information, Jamie Butler is the Director of Research and Development at Mandiant. He's focused mainly on host analysis and operating systems research. I'm a uh, computer science major at the Rochester Institute of Technology, but I'm currently on co-op at Mandiant working on their enterprise product as a software developer. So we're going to speak today about physical memory forensics, and this is kind of a layout of the talk. First, we're going to go over traditional forensic methods, <coughs> kind of a background information, uh, and then specifically move on to memory forensics, um, and given that background, we're going to speak about the issues that are in existing tools right now. So a lot of them are missing important information and often misattributing data to executables. Um, so most memory forensics also deals with utilizing files. So we're going to speak about memory mapped files, reconst recons reconstituting binaries and data files, and um, specifically the role that cache plays in this process. Then we're going to talk about possible applications of our new techniques and show you guys a couple of demos. And then we're going to speak about our new tool that we're going to be releasing pretty soon that uses these new techniques and speak about, wrap up with just some further work that needs to be done in the area. So traditional forensics is kind of a broad overview. A host has two large sources of information for forensics, so the disk and memory. And lately, memory has become a great way to triage a host, say, in a forensics investigation. So the reasons for this are the average size of disk is growing extremely high. So most hard drives out there come at least 250 gigabytes. Uh, I know people in this room probably have way more storage space than that. So searching through that whole image or just dumping a full copy of the hard drive is getting to be a, a much longer process. And memory can really help you out to speed up what you're looking for. Um, it's relatively small comparatively, so you can scan the whole space pretty quickly. Also, for intruders to get their code running on a system, they have to load it into memory. And in almost all cases out there, they aren't covering their tracks. They aren't um, cloaking their memory footprint because that's it's really just too much work for in the most case. So also, many of the artifacts that the kernel needs to load the program into memory, we can use to gain a lot more information about the executable. So specifically for memory forensics, memory is divided really into two basic sections, user land and kernel memory. This talk is going to focus on user land memory, again, because in most attacks, most intrusions, they're focusing on user land memory. It's, it's easier to get execution, and it's more resilient to coding errors. Basically, if you're <laughs> developing this attack, um, then if you got a couple bugs in your program, all of a sudden you have to crash the system because it's running in the kernel. So it's, it becomes very costly to develop these kind of attacks. So uh, memory forensics traditionally focuses on recovering all the binaries out of the memory. So all the executables, DLLs. This is one of the main focuses of any investigation. Uh, and most of these tools rely on virtual address descriptors, or VADs. These describe the process's address space in memory. 
Um, and they make up, they're made up of these uh, objects. So as you can see, it's got a pointer to left and right child. It's usually in a, vat, in a tree structure. And um, each VAD also contains the starting address and the size of the memory, along with a uh, pointer to the control area. So here's a representation of a typical VAD tree. Uh, you can see it starts with the VAD root, and just each one of those VADs contains information about the virtual addresses of the process. So um, traditionally, you would scan physical memory for an e-process block, and that kind of lets you know that there's a process at that location. From there, you get the directory table base or your DTB in the e-process, and um, this will help you translate from virtual to physical addresses. Uh, from there, you locate the, the root of the VAD, VAD tree and just kind of step through the tree, translating the virtual addresses to physical, and um, usually start with the starting address, take the size, and just grab all the data in between there. Um, some other tools also utilize information about the PE headers to reconstruct the executable with their knowledge about the different sections inside. Uh, the, an alternate approach is to just use the DTB to try and translate, basically brute force the whole address space. <coughs> and um, it kind of just starts at a beginning address and goes all the way through to the end. And this has its limitations, really. On a four or on a 32-bit system, this pretty much works because you got an upper bound of about like four gigabytes. But on 64-bit, the size could just be enormous. And uh, this also leads to some misattribution of the data because the virtual addresses could translate globally not particularly for that process. And uh, this kind of leads us to uh, problems that are in existing tools right now being used. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Jamie Bowen. So as uh, Justin mentioned, the traditional approach in the current memory forensic tools is to really to take a virtual address, its base and a size, you know, even if that virtual start is zero and size is four gig, you're going to brute force across the whole thing and you're going to do the translation in the context of the process that you're trying to analyze. So every process, as the previous slide showed, has a directory table base and that is used for the virtual to physical translation and that should tell you what's in the process context. <clears throat> well, what we found in our research is that there's a lot of data that's actually missing if you do this. Um, for instance, the first thing that we encountered is when we're trying to reconstruct a process, obviously like the attackers usually injecting code, you know, in the form of an injected DLL or whatever into the process address space. So in order to analyze that and to detect it, we need to be able to translate the code for that DLL. Well, the operating system, the Windows uh, loader, is going to load the DLL as a memory map file. So memory map files are stored in a special way because basically the OS doesn't want to waste space. And what do we mean by that? Well, on a Windows host, you have, uh, let's say, a user mode process or every user mode process most likely has a has the DLL, ntdll.dll mapped into its address space. So if, <clears throat> if the OS did not use uh, memory map files or these shared files across the address spaces of all processes, then that DLL would have to be replicated for every single process that loads. So obviously that would waste a lot of physical memory and this design was thought up, you know, back in the 
probably Windows 16-bit versions when there wasn't a lot of memory to waste in the first place. Plus, it's also just more efficient in today's world. You know, we're greener, so let's not waste memory. So these memory map files are shared across all processes, even if they're only used once, right? So because of this, they may, not, they may be in your process address space, but the address that they represent may not translate in your page table entries. So I won't go into the depths of how you do virtual to physical translation. If you want to learn more about that, um, there's slides on the internet and so forth. You can Google those. But basically, um, the page table entry is the very last table structure you'll find when doing a, a virtual to physical address translation. When you go to read it to find out where the physical page is, lo and behold, it's all zeros. So that doesn't tell you anything. That means typically we just had to ignore that region because we couldn't get access to it. And here's an example uh, of taking the, the HoneyNet Project Challenge 3. Um, if you're familiar with that, that was a memory image. <clears throat> Came out about a year and a half ago. I translated um, or I acquired these files out of the memory image. And there I just chose file at random. And you see the file size there in the first column. And then the bytes acquired with the traditional approach. So that's using the VADs. That's a starting virtual address, ending virtual address, and using the DTB of the process to acquire it. And that's how much of the, of the file that we could acquire. And then I uh, used a different technique that we're going to cover in the, the last half of this uh, presentation, which was using what's called file objects, uh, which represent the memory map files. So for instance, with you know, the, the ace.dll, we got 70% of it using the traditional method but we were able to increase that to 93% using um, this uh, more accurate method of the file objects. <clears throat> also, we'll talk about in a moment like what you can do, how this number may go up to actually 100% if you're running on a live system and not a memory image because you have access to the disk. Uh, the second problem that we ran into was basically um, when you're doing, we come from a background where we're, we build products and tools to do uh, incident response. So in that context, and even in probably some of your more traditional forensic investigations, trying to determine exactly which process is infected is important. So knowing the whole host is infected is perhaps interesting, but then the next question your boss is going to ask you is, well, 